Welcome to everybody um, to this, our second uh, webinar in our green series. Um, it's great to welcome so many from around the world. Um, I'm Keith Newton. I'm the Secretary General of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and, and Transport. Um, and our theme today is future challenges for the transport and logistics profession. Um, and it's with great pleasure that um, I introduce um, our international president, Dr. Radzo Malek, um, who will be uh, making some closing remarks um, and joining in the session. Um, and very importantly, um, we're very pleased to welcome again, um, uh, Professor Alan McKinnon uh, to one of our events. Um, Alan is the Professor of Logistics in the Kuna Logistics University in Hamburg. Um, the Pref Professor Emeritus at Harriet Watt University, Edinburgh, and of course is a Chartered Fellow of the CILT. Um, he's been researching and teaching in freight transport logistics for over 40 years, and very importantly, um, for a large part of the last 15 years, his focus has been on environmental aspects um, of logistics. So he brings that great knowledge and understanding to us today on what is um, such a critical subject for the profession. Um, I chatted to Alan uh, last week um, uh, and we, we realised that we had had parallel paths, I think, in, uh, in transport and logistics. Um, uh, Alan I was just leaving university as I started. So, and we also, um, the other thing that we found out that is that we both did a degree in geography and had a passion to, to want to um, work in what was a reasonably newest sector logistics and transport um, at that time. Um, and as a result, we were both members of um, the Institute of Physical Distribution Management, um, which was uh, created in the 80s and became ultimately part of CILT. So, uh, so it's... Um, it is with really great pleasure that uh, I welcome um, back Alan to uh, um, to talk to us today. Um, he's going to uh, present to us first of all, and uh, then, um, as Jasper says, we'll be seeking to ask um, Alan some questions and just get into a conversation later on. So please do have your questions ready. So thank you. Without further ado, I'll um, hand over to Professor Alan McKinnon. Okay, good day everyone. Uh, th thank you for that introduction, Keith. Uh, interesting that we've got a similar vintage and similar disciplinary background in geography uh, as, as well. Um, thank you for mentioning my university too. Um, I should say maybe a few words about that. It's, uh, we think, the only uh, university which specialises in logistics. It's based in Hamburg in Germany. Uh, it was founded in 2010, uh, so we're now in our 11th year. We're a small university, but um, very active in the research and the teaching that we, we do. Um, so I've a lot to get through in this presentation. Um, I've, there's quite a high density of uh, graphs and diagrams and things, and I hope you find this presentation interesting. I'd like to begin just with some photographs, um, because sadly the movement of people and goods uh, does a lot of damage uh, to the environment, to the atmosphere, to land, to oceans as illustrated in these photographs. So we've got um, air pollution at the top, the visible forms of air pollution. Um, we, we've got the amount of land that's consumed by transport and logistics activities. Um, we've got the um, severance of uh, ecosystems. We've got accidents, we've got oil spillages. Uh, we've got the noise and vibration problems caused by transport. Um, and then we've got the disposal of all the transport and logistics assets, which again has a fairly big um, impact on the environment. Um, and then there are the invisible uh, pollutants, uh, predominantly NOx, nitrogen oxide, and also CO2. Um, and uh, I, I don't have time in this presentation to go through and talk about each of these environmental impacts in turn, but I would like to highlight a few. Um, one in particular, um, particulate matter, the small, very small particles emitted mainly by diesel fuel um, with a called PM 2.5 because their diameter is, is about 2.5 microns, uh, which are absorbed by the body and affect almost all the major organs in the body. Uh, they have a very damaging effect on 
respiratory system, cardiovascular system, reproductive system, um, neurological systems as well, um, and are a major health problem in many parts of the world. Um, the World Health Organization in 2018 uh, looked at the concentration of these PM 2.5 uh, part particles in major cities around the world. Uh, they didn't have much data for Africa, unfortunately, but um, it does show you how the problem is very much concentrated in the Far East and, and, and also in, in African uh, cities as well. And there was a paper published in 2019 using 2015 data, um, which looked at the uh, pollution uh, of PM 2.5 and also ozone pollution coming from transport. And they reckoned that that cost in that year 300 and 85,000 deaths. They reckon 7.8 million years of people's lives were lost through the inhalation of those uh, pollutants. And they, they put a monetary value on that of about $1 trillion. So it gives you a sense of the scale of the pollution problem caused by, by transport. Um, but things have been improving. You know, since the early 1990s, um, we've seen tightening emission controls on new vehicles, uh, limiting exhaust emissions of NOx and, and particulate matter. Uh, you can see how in different parts of the world, um, the level of emissions from new vehicles has been declining. Um, and uh, there's data from the UN for 2020 suggests that in most parts of the world now, um, Road vehicles uh, achieve a, a euro emission standard of at least four or, or above. Um, problem is, is Africa, as you can see, um, where many countries don't really have very high emission standards currently. Part of the problem here is lies with the fuel um, because there's too much sulfur in the fuel. And as a result, that makes it uh, difficult to introduce the um, pollution abatement systems. Um, that's road-based transport. If we look at maritime transport, where sulfur is again a problem, the maritime fuels contain a high degree of sulfur, uh, which then become sulfur uh, oxides. But again, that has been reducing. Um, so one can see from the year 2000, how there's been a dramatic reduction in the permitted levels of sulfur in marine fuels. Um, the last big change was at the beginning of last year when the International Maritime Organization uh, imposed a global limit um, of 0.5% uh, sulfur content in marine fuel. And shortly before the decision was made to do that, uh, there was a study which suggested that if that latest global limit on sulfur content in marine fuels was not implemented, then they reckoned that by 2025, uh, there would be something like another half a million people would suffer premature deaths as a result of inhaling sulfur oxides. Um, now, I've shown how things have been improving. Um, we've been uh, easing the pollutant problem. We've been cleaning the air, really, by uh, controlling the emissions of those pollutants which have a local or regional impact, as you can see. But as we've been doing that, uh, concern has mounted about climate change, about the greenhouse gases uh, dominated by CO2, which accounts for over 90% of transport related greenhouse gases, but other um, greenhouse gases like methane and, and nitrous oxide uh, as well. And uh, much of my attention in this uh, presentation is going to focus on, on climate change. Um, so what I've tried to do in this slide um, is encapsulate in, in a single image um, the magnitude and urgency of the climate change problem that now confronts us. Um, back in 2017, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published a very influential report which suggested that it was imperative that we keep the increase in average global temperature between 1850 and 2100 within one and a half degrees centigrade. Uh, you know, as, uh, the consequences of not doing that are very severe in terms of extreme weather, sea level rise, and, and so forth. Um, now, that's going to be hard because we are already 1.2 degrees centigrade above the 1850 figure. So we don't have very much time left to do this. And this graph, I, I think, illustrates this. Um, climate scientists these days think very much in terms of carbon budgets the amount of greenhouse gas we're able to put into the atmosphere to stay within certain increases in temperature. 
And so they reckon that um, what, what this, this graph shows is the CO2 reductions required for us to have a two thirds chance of staying within that 1.5 degree temperature limit. Um, now, if we had begun to reduce our emissions uh, way back in 2000, um, then we could more gradually have reduced the emissions through time at about 4% per annum. But unfortunately, we, we're still not in the process of reducing them. I mean, emissions are still rising steeply, um, which means that to stay within that cap and budget, there's no need to be an almost precipitous decline in emissions. And of course, many people realize now that that is just not going to be possible. Um, uh, if, if we do nothing, uh, then extreme weather will become more frequent and more intense and more damaging. Uh, the other big worry, of course, is that we cross climatic tipping points from which there will be no uh, easy reverse. Um, uh, so I, I said that it's unlikely, almost impossible now, for us to get down to zero emissions to stay within that carbon budget. Um, nevertheless, I mean, the United Nations uh, has a a scheme, uh, they call it the race to zero, uh, to encourage as many countries and businesses and cities in the world uh, to commit to being net zero emissions by 2050 or, or earlier. Um, and as you can see, many of them have, have done that. But notice the word net here. Uh, we're not talking about an absolute zero or a gross zero. Um, what we will have to do now is absorb or sequester a lot of the greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere. Now, there are various ways in which we can do this. Um, there's a scheme called BEX, bioengineering, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. We can use afforestation. We can use devices which will actually suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, a lot of these things are technologically fairly immature as yet. Um, and uh, some scientists dispute that it's gonna be feasible organizing these things on a planetary scale really to rescue us. Um, but this is something we have to recognize. It's not just a matter anymore of cutting emissions that we actually have to um, draw down many of the greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere. And some people think the concept of net zero um, is a policy trap. It, it, it makes some politicians and managers feel that we can continue emitting uh, and then leave it to future generations to, to um, absorb that CO2. And that would be a very dangerous strategy. How does this relate to transport? Well, just last week, the International Transport Forum uh, published its latest outlook report. The ITF has the, the largest model used to um, you know, forecast future trends in passenger and freight transport and, and to look at the related CO2 emissions. And on the basis of their analysis, they reckon that current policies uh, for transport um, would still see emissions rise by 16% from 2015 to 2050. Right. So we're a long way there for getting down to zero or net zero. Uh, in the case of freight transport, it's even worse. They're, they're projecting a 22% increase with the policies currently in place. They have another scenario, however, which they call their reshape plus scenario, um, which would um, see those emissions dropping quite sharply. So as much as 70% uh, for all transport, that's passenger and freight, and for 72% just for, for freight transport on its own. But that scenario would require a lot of very radical measures, some fairly draconian measures that are not currently on the policy agenda. Um, now, in much of this talk, I'm going to talk about freight transport because that's the field in which I specialize now for many years. But for another reason, it seems to me that freight does not get the attention it deserves in these climate change discussions. So following the Paris 2016 agreement um, on climate change, um, countries submitted what they called NDCs, Nationally Determined Contribution Statements, explaining how they would cut their emissions. Now, about 150 of those NDCs um, actually refer to transport. And, mentioned measures that would be used, uh, but only 13 of them specifically mention freight transport, setting targets or policies specifically for freight. And that is despite the fact that freight transport represents about 42% of all transport related CO2 emissions worldwide. Um, so we need to do more about freight, it seems to me. Where do the freight transport emissions come from? Well, predominantly from road transport. Um, from trucks and vans, they account for about two thirds of the emissions, but see also, as you can see, represents a, a significant portion. Uh, now, because of all of this, what I'm going to do is really focus very much on the decarbonisation of road freight in the remainder of this presentation. 
Now, to take a global perspective on this, um, uh, the, again, the International Transport Forum has examined the rates at which the carbon intensity of road freight transport is declining in different parts of the world. Uh, in the case of the EU, um, that carbon intensity is already relatively low, um, and it's projected to drop quite significantly by 2050. The problem resides in other parts of the world, particularly in Africa and India, where currently the carbon intensity of road rate is much higher and it, it's going to be declining more gradually. And related to that is the ITF modelling suggests that in the future, most of the road freight related emissions are going to come from non-OECD countries. The, the more developed countries of Europe and North America um, have, have, will be emitting less of that. So what we find therefore is that the projection is that the main future growth of road freight emissions is going to come from those regions where the rates of decarbonisation are slower. And that is clearly a problem. But if we look more generally at the decarbonisation of freight transport, um, it is regarded as a sector that is going to be very hard to decarbonise, primarily for two reasons. One, because of its almost total dependence on fossil fuel currently, but also because of the very high forecast growth rate for freight movement. Um, in the report published last week by the International Transport Forum, they are predicting a 2.6 times growth in freight ton kilometers worldwide by all transport modes between 2015 and 2020. So what do we do um, to decarbonize freight transport? Well, um, the good news is that there are many things that we can do. There is no single silver bullet. Uh, there's a whole range of things and they can be classified into five categories. Um, there are things we could do just to reduce the amounts of freight movement. Um, we could then shift as much freight as possible onto lower carbon transport modes from road to rail, for example. We can then make better use of the vehicle capacity, fill the vehicles better. We can improve the energy efficiency with which we operate freight vehicles. And, and, and finally, we can uh, reduce the, the carbon content of the energy that we use in the freight transport system. Now, many of you may have come across the so-called avoid, shift, improve framework for decarbonisation. Um, all I have done here is split the improve category into three, as you can see. Um, but this is well aligned with the ASI framework that's often used. So let's look at each of these options in turn. First of all, reducing the amount of freight movement, or at least restraining the future growth in freight movement. Now, one way in which we could do that would be to reconfigure supply chains because we can put into reverse those logistical supply chain processes that have generated much of the growth in freight movement in the past. Things like globalization, centralization of production and inventory. Um, so we could reshore manufacturing from low labor cost countries back to Europe and North America. We could localize sourcing, we could decentralize production and inventory. All of those things, however, would have a very high carbon mitigation cost. Um, and it would be difficult for us to do them quickly. Um, so while they may happen, and, and that would be to be encouraged, um, I, I don't, this is one of the more difficult decarbonization options. Um, looking beyond the transport sphere, um, we can just reduce the amount of stuff that needs to be moved. This is already beginning to happen. Um, you know, if we move into what they call the share economy, um, with people less interested necessarily in owning things and being prepared to, to share them, uh, we could apply more aggressively the principles of the circular economy, uh, increasing recycling and remanufacturing. We could design products with less materials, and that's already well pronounced in the electronic sector, for example, where we miniaturize and lightweight products. We can digitize more physical products, like which has already happened, obviously, for entertainment, educational media, and so forth, converting physical consignments into electrons. And hopefully 3D printing might also help us to reduce the amount of stuff that we have to move by, by streamlining supply chains. Another thing which will help is um, the move out of fossil fuel, right? So um, it, it, we're predicting that uh, there'll be a dramatic reduction in our use of oil, coal and gas over the next few decades. Currently about 30% of ton kilometers worldwide are fossil fuels, right? Uh, but unfortunately there'll be other uh, areas of freight traffic growth um, 
because if we get out of fossil fuel, we will have to put in place um, a very elaborate renewable energy infrastructure. That process is already underway with uh, wind turbines and solar panels and so forth. That will generate freight movement. There's a huge growth worldwide currently in air conditioning. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have to absorb a lot of the CO2 um, from power stations, for example. We're going to have to draw down CO2 and capture and store it underground. Again, that will involve freight movement. Um, using what we call negative emission technologies. Um, we can scrub CO2 out of the atmosphere, but um, th those machines will have to be built and moved. We'll have to adapt to all the climate change that is in the pipeline. Um, climate proofing our built environment will generate a lot of material movements. And also we'll have to reset a lot of population. It's estimated that about 220 million people in the world live within five meters of sea level who will have to be rehoused. Again, all of that will generate more great movement. So I'm not overly optimistic that we're going to reduce the total amount of freight movement very much. So we move to the second option, which is that of shifting as much freight as possible onto lower carbon transport modes. You can see the reasons for doing that. The carbon intensity of freight transport modes varies enormously from uh, short haul air cargo to bulk cargo vessels. Um, in many countries, the debate is more about how we shift freight from road to rail and waterborne systems. Now, again, some good news here. We, my university did a survey of 92 logistics executives in Europe um, last year, and we asked them what they thought was the most cost-effective way of decarbonizing logistics in Europe. And top of the list, as you can see, was shifting freight to cleaner transport modes. Um, but there are problems with that. Um, First of all, in most countries in the world, the railways have been losing market share. There are very few countries that have so far managed to reverse that process. The UK, where I am now, is one of them. Mexico is another, but there are a few. The other thing is that a core traffic for rail networks worldwide has been fossil fuel. So as we phase out fossil fuel, that's going to deprive the railways of one of their core traffics. And it's going to be hard for them, it seems to me, to replace that with other higher value manufactured goods, for example. The other thing is currently the um, emission intensity gap between road and rail is, is narrowing. But there are other very positive things you can say about rail. Um, it is by far the most electrified mode. Um, about half of the freight moved by rail currently is hauled worldwide by el electric trains. Uh, much of the world's uh, rail network is electrified, which is going to make it easier for us to get low carbon electricity into the, into the rail sector. And many countries around the world, and in, in the case of the EU here in, in Europe, um, are promoting intermodal transport, uh, often using a corridor structure to do that. There's a new concept called synchromodality, um, which relates to as the name suggests, synchronizing uh, services across different transport modes uh, to facilitate the, the transfer of freight between modes. And, and if companies were to embed this concept of synchromodality into the way they manage their production and inventory, again, that would greatly improve the prospects of getting freight on the, on the rail network. Third set of measures is making better use of vehicle capacity. Um, now, this can be done short term. Right? It can yield significant uh, CO2 savings. Uh, the carbon mitigation costs are low. In fact, often they're negative because filling the vehicles better um, will save you money as well as cutting carbon. And it's something that can be done in the short to medium term. Um, so what am I talking about? One is just reducing the amount of empty running, which is quite high um, in many parts of the, the world. Um, but it's also um, improving the loading of already loaded vehicles. Um, now, in much of the developed world, the emphasis is on um, reversing the underloading problem. Many vehicles are underloaded. Um, in much of the developing world, the problem is vehicles being overloaded, um, which can be just as damaging in terms of climate change. If the engine is laboring, it's using more fuel and emitting more CO2, and this can also damage the road pavement. And uh, then, in a sense, the fuel efficiency of all categories of uh, traffic are adversely affected. Um, so when I say, I'm, I'm not saying maximize the loading, of I'm saying optimize the, the loading of the vehicles, often keeping them within weight restrictions. One of the problems we have here is that there's a lack of statistics worldwide on the uh, loading of vehicles. And um, 
uh, that, that makes it difficult for us to estimate the potential CO2 savings. But there are things we can do to improve vehicle loading. We can encourage companies to collaborate and, and to share their vehicle capacity. Digitalization, it seems to me, is going to have a quite dramatic effect on load matching and the loading of our vehicles. Um, we can relax constraints on the size and weight of trucks, as has happened in many countries, uh, both here in Europe and in North America and South Africa and so forth, which again allows us to consolidate loads. And something which many people would regard as heresy is we could maybe contemplate relaxing the just-in-time principle um, to give companies more time to, to load vehicles better. My fourth category of measure is um, improving the energy efficiency of freight transport. Now, we can take a long term perspective on this and rely on new technologies to do that, either for the vehicles like trucks or ships or, or, or even using platooning, you know, where we electronically couple the vehicles um, so they can run in a convoy more fuel efficiently or we can automate the vehicles. We've also got fuel economy standards now being introduced by many countries around the world requiring uh, trucks and ships um, to meet certain uh, energy efficiency standards. I think in the case of trucks and vans, about 70% of new truck and van sales worldwide are subject to fuel economy standards. Um, and that will, uh, again, improve energy efficiency. In the short term, we can um, retrofit fuel saving devices like anti-idling devices to trucks. Um, we can train drivers, truck drivers, to drive more fuel efficiently. That's been shown to be one of the most cost effective ways of cutting CO2 emissions in the freight sector. And then we can use um, telematic monitoring of driver performance to make sure that the drivers continue to apply those good practices. We can also improve vehicle maintenance. We can change business practices. If one looks at the maritime world, one of the main ways in which CO2 has been reduced in shipping um, over the past 15 years is through the practice of slow steaming, simply slowing down the vessels. So they burn less fuel and emit less CO2. And the same principle can be applied in the trucking sector. A number of big trucking companies uh, in recent years have reduced the, the maximum speed at which the trucks can travel. And again, that's translated into less CO2. And then my fifth category of measures is uh, reducing the carbon content of the energy. Now, um, if we look at all the various freight transport modes, uh, what you can see is there are a, a number of low carbon energy options available. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, there's a lot of uncertainty as to which of these low carbon options will, will dominate. There's a lot of disagreement currently. Indeed, there's a lot of lobbying um, for particular fuels like hydrogen as opposed to batteries and, and so forth. Um, now, I, I always feel we, we, we really don't have the time to debate this endlessly. We really have to get our act together to decide what the main low carbon pathways are for these different modes. Um, the other problem we have, of course, is the long lifespan of the vehicle assets. Um, I mean, the, the average ship in 2018 was 21 years old. Um, you know, so it takes us a while to, to turn around uh, the, the fleets uh, in these different modes, and that's going to slow this transition to low carbon. We have another problem too in coordinating the development of transport energy infrastructures with the manufacture of the new generation of low carbon vehicles, vessels and aircraft, um, particularly those with long replacement cycles. And the other thing is, uh, assuming that we're um, electrifying or using biofuels, I mean, the freight sector will have to compete with other sectors for low carbon electricity and, and for, uh, for, for alternative fuels. Now, I personally believe it's electrification that will deliver um, the, the main reductions in, in greenhouse gases from freight transport. And the good news here is that um, the average carbon intensity of electricity is dropping worldwide. And um, the International Energy Agency has an optimistic scenario that um, by 2040, it will be less than 100 grams of uh, CO2 per kilowatt hour. Um, but that rate of decline varies a lot around the world. Currently, the carbon intensity of electricity varies a lot and the rate at which it declines uh, varies. So it's hard to take a global perspective on this. Now, if you look at road freight, how we decarbonize that? Well, this process is already well underway, certainly in the developed world, um, for um, vans, for local delivery operations, taking advantage of the dramatic reduction in the uh, battery storage cost in recent years, and also the extension of uh, battery recharging facilities and the narrowing price gap between battery powered vehicles and petrol and diesel vehicles. 
And more problematic is the decarbonisation of long haul trucking, where there's been a debate as to whether that should be done by batteries or, or hydrogen. It was always felt that batteries wouldn't work because they'd be too heavy and they would take too long to recharge. But recent research, recent improvements in battery performance suggest that the weight penalty will be less than people previously thought. And, and also we can now use fast chargers to recharge long haul trucks more quickly. Um, many people are promoting hydrogen as a way of decarbonizing long haul trucking. It certainly would offer a longer range, more rapid refueling, but almost all the hydrogen currently used is essentially a fossil fuel. It's made with methane, it's what we call grey hydrogen, and there's a debate as to how long it's going to take us to produce enough green hydrogen made by electrolyzing water with low carbon electricity. And also, even when we get to that electrolysis process, we waste a lot of energy. We waste about 70% of energy in the uh, supply chain for this green hydrogen. So I, I'm what you might call a hydrogen skeptic uh, on, on this area. Another idea is to electrify the road network. So just as we have with the railways, we can have overhead catenaries, which will power um, trucks directly. Um, and there are several trials underway in, in Sweden, Germany, and, and the US on this. It's got a higher capital cost. Um, um, and there's a debate as to how dense the, the network of electrified roads would have to be to make this work. And again, you've got the coordination of the infrastructure development with the truck manufacturing, which is a, a bit uncertain currently. And again, if we take a global perspective on this, one thing that concerns me is how these low carbon vehicle technologies are going to disseminate into the less developed world. Because currently, uh, less developed countries rely very heavily on imports of trucks from Europe and from North America. Um, and one thing that worries me is that as Europe and North America moves to low carbon trucking, uh, they will want to offload a lot of their existing diesel vehicles into the developing world that will then deprice, de depress the price of these vehicles and, and uh, discourage the transition there to these low carbon vehicles. Also, the, it's expected that the battery and hydrogen powered vehicles will have a much longer lifespan. And so it will take longer for them to find their way into the import channels. And also there's a worry about the amount of material in batteries and hydrogen fuel cells that governments in the in Europe and North America may not want those materials to be in, exported uh, in secondhand vehicles. And, and then it's the length of time it's going to take less developed countries to um, install battery recharging and, and, and alternative fuel charging systems. So it's not difficult to be pessimistic about the rate at which um, we're going to see that transition to low carbon vehicles in other parts of the world. Now, just to end, um, I would like to talk a bit about um, uh, you know, how we develop a, a strategy for decarbonizing transport and logistics. I published a book on this subject and, and in there I discuss what I call my 10C approach, where I use 10 English words beginning with the letter C. The first is corporate motivation. Uh, it's tough to decarbonize. You have to have enough enthusiasm within the organization to do that. The second C is calculating your emissions. The third is then committing to targets to reduce those emissions. The fourth is then consider all the options for meeting those targets. At that stage, you should probably to look beyond your own corporate boundaries to collaborate with others, because the feeling is that to achieve really deep reductions in transport and logistics emissions, we'll have to see much greater sharing of assets. We then move to a cost evaluation of these decarbonization options. Um, and in the light of all of that, a company would choose a set of options. Now, there's no one size fits all here. Um, every company will have to, or every organization um, will have to um, develop its own strategy, taking account of a whole range of factors. Perhaps at that stage, a company or business might then consider carbon offsetting um, to pay others to come cut some emissions on their behalf to help them meet their targets. You can then implement the strategy, cut emissions, and learn from that experience. And, in the light of that, you may then want to recalibrate your decarbonization strategy, maybe um, changing the way you, you calculate emissions, uh, maybe strengthening your targets, maybe revising your cost estimates. To help you with that, there are various schemes. So there is something called the Global Logistics Emissions Council, um, which advises businesses on how they should measure and report their logistics-related emissions. And then for targeting, there's a scheme called um, the uh, 
science-based targeting initiative worldwide, which gives organizations advice on how they should be setting targets in line with uh, the climate science. And then finally, what does all this mean for the transport and logistics profession? It seems to me that in the light of everything I've said, we will need um, to build up the level of skill and competence in the decarbonization of transport and logistics. And I see that happening in nine ways. First of all, it seems to me there needs to be greater appreciation of the climate science uh, because managers working with their staff have to make them aware of why we're prioritizing decarbonization as an activity. Um, also, managers will have to develop a much better understanding of the processes in transport and logistics which generate greenhouse gas emissions. This is where it's often helpful to have a good knowledge of chemistry and physics. Um, the, the third is, is to be able to put in place carbon measurement systems to know about the various um, methodologies and reporting standards and the various sources of emissions data. Again, that's something you require. You need uh, sort of some skills in setting realistic targets uh, for doing that. And as I said, there's a science-based targeting initiative now, which does provide much advice in that area. Um, again, organizations around the world will be decarbonizing within government policy frameworks. And so one will have to develop a knowledge of what government plans are for decarbonization and there that you have to regularly update that knowledge uh, as well. You have to stay abreast of advances in carbon reducing technologies um, because uh, although in the early years I, I think we're probably going to be focusing more on behavioral and managerial change, in the longer term we're going to have to rely very heavily on technology and so one has to keep up to date with what's happening in that sphere. One has to develop economic analytical skills as well. There's a process called marginal abatement cost analysis, uh, where you can work out the relative carbon mitigation costs of a whole range of ways of decarbonizing transport and logistics. Again, that's going to, I think, become a core competence for transport professionals. Um, it's going to be expensive in the longer term, decarbonizing transport and logistics. And so organizations will have to uh, acquire more external finance to do that. Um, and, and therefore more, more, more real skills in, in how to exploit the available green finance to support the decarbonization of transport. And then finally, there's the whole process of change management. Um, if, if nothing else, I hope what I've shown you is, is the, the magnitude and the speed with which we're going to have to cut carbon emissions from transport and logistics. That gets us into the realms of change management. How do businesses uh, achieve that? Not just businesses, governments achieve that as well. So what we need is what I call decarbonization related change management. Um, and, and that really ought to be, again, a core competence for people in this sector. So I hope you found that of interest. Um, I'm a, an author and co-author of books on this subject, which you may be uh, interested in. There's my email address. Uh, if you have any further questions, I'd be happy to, to deal with them. And I'll stop at that stage and, and turn you back to, to Keith. Thank you, Professor Allen. Um, that was wonderful. Um, we, we, uh, uh, there's so much there, I think, for us to absorb. I think I'll just let you draw breath a bit, but um, you're, you, we, we, um, the purpose was to highlight the env environmental impact of transport as a whole and um, focus particularly on climate change and the freight transport, which I think you did remarkably well, and consider what we need to decarbonize logistics. And there was so much in all those slides that um, those on the call, uh, they will be available and we will be issuing a recording of um, this presentation. So if you wanted to go back over that, which I'm sure many will do then uh, uh, next week, um, it will be live on our website. So, um, and then last you touched on skills and competencies um, and what basically we need to do um, as um, transport and logistics professionals. So I'd like to sort of, uh, and I'm sure the uh, attendees are going to help me on this, um, get into um, each of those areas really in, in our conversation. We've got about 30 minutes to do that. Um, and straight away, we do have um, one very good question uh, from Usman Shuaibu, um, 
who actually um, is our deputy global convener for our next generation. Um, and uh, he hails from Nigeria. So you can, um, Alan, you can sort of sense where the question's coming from. If I read it out so everybody can hear. Um, he says, thank you, Professor Allen. I quite agree with you that decarbonisation is problematic for developing economies, given the trade-off on the triple, triple baseline, e.g. economic, social and environment. Mm -hmm. It seems that current effort focus is more on environmental and less emphasis on social. How can this be framed and fit into top, the top agenda in the developing countries? Um, so quite a quite a question there to kick you off with. Yes, yes, um, very difficult question to answer in a few words. Um, I, I agree. I, I mean, sustainability has the three dimensions. Obviously, the economic, social, and environmental. Uh, today, I just focused on the environmental one, um, but there have to be trade offs here. Um, you're from Africa. Um, the, the average carbon emissions per capita in African countries is very low relative to that of Europe and in North America and so forth. But regrettably, companies, countries in the tropics are the ones who are probably most exposed to adverse weather effects. So there is this fundamental unfairness, ethical issue here that, that it's people living in the countries that will be most affected by climate change are the ones who are contributing less to the problem. And the ones who are at an earlier stage in the development process. Um, and, and so the challenge is going to be to help these countries to develop still and, and to raise living standards and, and to deal with the social issues that you've mentioned, but in a lower carbon way, so that they don't follow the development pathway that we have in Europe or in North America, because that will destroy the planet. But we therefore need a transfer of capital and resources and expertise into less developed countries so that they can find that lower carbon pathway. And, um, and that applies to all sectors. It applies, I think, as much to logistics and to transport as, as it would be to other industrial sectors as well. So hopefully that's given some idea. Incidentally, I'm, I've, I've been commissioned to write a paper for the World Bank uh, looking at how we can tailor current logistics decarbonisation strategies to the needs of less developed countries. Because a lot of the work that's been done in this area really applies to Europe and North America. So um, later in the year, hopefully that paper will be published and that will maybe give some advice. Right, that, that, that's very helpful because obviously as an institute we're covering across and we can, I can see the people on the call are coming from a whole variety of countries there. So uh, that, that will be very interesting because it's such a, an important topic, isn't it? just looking at the data that you were presenting, um, Alan. Um, the questions are coming in thick and fast. So I'm going, because we're aiming at answering things for the attendees, um, I will remove my reserve list of questions to one side and fire with the next one for you. So um, Wentz Morris, um, who's um, uh, currently a member in the Middle East, um, is um, asking about localization. Um, instead of globalization. And of course that, um, for many um, different political reasons, that's been a hot topic, hasn't it, in the last, yeah. last uh, few years. Um, do, what's your view on that in terms of how important that is as an option and in terms of the whole decarbonization yeah. Um, agenda? Yeah, uh, in some cases that is certainly an effective decarbonization policy, but you've got to be very careful. Um, you, you've got to, assuming you're, you're sourcing products from one country to another, you've got to do the full life cycle analysis. Because when you do that for a whole range of traded products, what you discover is that the freight related emissions represent a small percentage of the total. That, that, the, that most of the emissions come from the production of that product. Um, and, and therefore, if we want to minimize emissions overall, we want to source the products from the locations where those production related emissions are minimized, even if that means that we emit more CO2 in the transport process. And, and, and some of the research that's been done at a macro level here um, is, is quite encouraging. I mean, it's estimated there was a paper published, I think in 2013, which suggested that about 40% of world trade actually reduces CO2 emissions because it's where the goods are sourced in countries with a lower carbon footprint for that product than if they had been produced in the home country. Mm. Right? 
Um, and, and therefore, what I would never recommend is, is that we just relocalize everything in an effort to cut CO2 emissions. That would be counterproductive. You know, but what we need to do is a lot more life cycle analysis. So we've got a good sense of where the low carbon locations are to, to source products. And that, that, that's quite an important concept for a lot of things, isn't it? The, the life cycle, because it's very easy to make decisions immediately on getting a, a, a new electric vehicle uh, without taking into account the, the sort of cost of getting rid of the old one, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, et cetera. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's very true, yeah. Um, the, the other thing too is almost certainly in the future, we will have carbon pricing in place mm -hmm. um, where we put a monetary value on CO2 emissions. Um, now, it would be great if that could be done globally uh, on a consistent basis. Um, and, and also if we set a realistic price for carbon, there was a high level group of experts did some work on this recently and, and they estimated, I think if, if globally we put a monetary value of about $130 per tonne of CO2 on carbon, and that was then factored into companies' balance sheets and so forth, that would send the right price signals. To that, some people have suggested if that were to happen, it would decimate world trade. But again, more recent work by the World Bank and I suggest that's not the case, that we would still have a thriving global trade system, even if we had quite high price attached to. to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I think we've got a, a, a question getting us into that topic of um, area of skills and particularly in terms of, well, um, what's our role in this as transport uh, professionals? And I think um, this is an absolute key area, really, when you look at the, uh, the, the scale of the issues that you've talked about. Um, and this is from Tim Foote. He's saying, what role should education be playing to train up managers before they move into the workplace? Um, so that, that could be aimed, I think, probably at uh, the younger generation. Um, but equally, um, I like your perspective too on the, those who've been around a long time and whether there's re-education needed for um, the more experienced managers who are perhaps locked into different um, patterns of behaviour. Yeah. Um, so over well, to you, as, as, a, as an older guy myself, I, I've got to tread very carefully on this, clearly. <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to set the, the different age groups against each other. Um, I mean, it's understandable the younger generation are more fired up on this issue. I mean, they are the ones who are going to be inheriting a seriously damaged planet that we're going to be leaving them. And uh, so, so they're obviously wanting the current generation of managers that you know, are in control and, uh, you know, to act more um, radically and, and, and more quickly to, to deal with the climate change problem. And, and that's perfectly understandable. Um, I always say it, it, it's there's no grounds for complacency. The current generation of managers cannot say climate change is a long-term problem. This is for future generations of managers to deal with. No, we have to start dealing with it now, right? And um, and and the other thing is we then have to equip the next generation of managers um, with the skill set that they, they need to manage this. And, and that's what I tried to do in my final slide, sort of flagging up areas uh, where we need um, more more knowledge, more skill, more competence. Um, but, but also many of the current managers, you know, need to be equipped with the right skill set uh, as well. And, and that's one thing my university has tried to do. I mean, I, I, a couple of years ago, I prepared a, a video course uh, on decarbonizing logistics, which has, and I was used by quite a few companies uh, around the world. Um, so um, now, in the past, a lot of the teaching uh, and course material on green logistics has been a bit peripheral, right? You've had your core curriculum on transport and logistics, um, and then there were some optional courses. Um, that, that has to change. We have to build environmental issues, environmental knowledge into the core curriculum. Um, and, and also look at the way, look at the trade-offs we're going to have to make between some of the traditional objectives in logistics management, like obviously maximizing efficiency and, and minimizing inventory and all these things. We've got to look at how that, th those objectives now can be traded off against the, um, the, the environmental imperatives that we have to deal with. So, 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 so really it's, it's a pretty fundamental 
um, review and, and modification, it seems to me, of the curricula that we are, we're applying here to, to, to equip the next generation of managers with all the right skills. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm muted there and that's as I asked you the question, but um, yeah, yeah, the, the, the sort of education is that A, there's got to be the material there, and B, there's got to be the will to um, to enable people, hasn't there, for a minute. I was interested in our conversation before you took, you spoke a lot about corporates and how actually um, your perception is that they're, um, they're actually starting to grasp that challenge of um, ensuring that their people understand yep. some of those impacts any sort of comment on that from an education viewpoint yeah i mean i, I think um there's been a step change really in in corporate commitment to decarbonization in the past mm -hmm. few years um mm -hmm. uh, i i think 2016 2017 was a sort of watershed time in, in climate change we had the ipcc report that i mentioned uh, we had a number of governments um suggesting we had a climate emergency to deal with um, and, and and the business world has responded to that, you know, um, and, and there are a whole range of schemes worldwide now um, to which companies belong, like the Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, there's a one called uh, the, the um, uh, We Mean Business Coalition, uh, there's the Race to Zero, the World Economic Forum is very active, so companies are not doing this individually, they're often doing it as part of a uh, uh, some organisational um, move towards decarbonisation, um, and and th that affects all aspects of their operation. You know, th their financing, their production operations, and so on. But it's also beginning to impact on the the way they manage their staff and and the, the way they train them and and so forth. Uh, but the question is, is all this happening quickly enough? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because in the graph I showed, you know. Um, even allowing for the fact we're going to have to absorb greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere, we still have to drive down our emissions at an incredible rate, you know, for us mm. to stay within the required carbon budget. Um, so I, I'm, I'm encouraged by what's happening, but I suspect it's not happening quickly enough, really, to... Yeah, to the yeah. Results. Um, yeah, and that links into another question because of this urgency, um, and it's taking us into the, the sort of government role. You spoke about corporates and the government role. Um, we've got the um, UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, so our, our um, UK government is making lots of um, uh, promising noises. But um, uh, Edward Lau, who's from Singapore, um, is saying, unfortunately, from observation, many governments, including in developed economies, let alone emerging markets, st are still playing lip service. What's your advice to the private sector, um, I think to, to us as professionals, um, that could push policy ma makers and public sector to accelerate the action um, to yeah. build the necessary ecosystem? Yeah. Well, as, as I mentioned, I think in the longer term, the thing that will drive it is the monetization of CO2. Mm. You know, once we put a monetary value on it, um, and it will then factor in, into companies' balance sheets, um, that, that will be the, the game changer, it, it seems to me. But unfortunately, that's still some way off. If you go to the World Bank website, uh, they have a dashboard because they're monitoring plans uh, around the world to introduce carbon pricing and carbon taxation. And the last time I checked, just a few weeks ago, um, they, they, they estimated that if all the carbon pricing schemes currently in place are being implemented, once they're all in place, that could cover as much as a quarter of global greenhouse gases, right? Mm. So, so this is a process which is developing and I think longer term, that will be the game changer. But of course, there are other things that will have to um, happen in, in the meantime. So in the case of logistics, for example, uh, as we well know, um, most logistics is outsourced, you know, um, and therefore that gives the shippers, the ones who are buying logistics services worldwide, a degree of power you know, in the, the way they procure logistic services could be done in, in a, a way that helps to minimize carbon emissions. You know, it puts greater <laughs> pressure on the logistic providers. Now, of course, many logistic providers have responded to that already. Um, DHL, for example, TV Schenker, UBS. I mean, they um, already have fairly radical policies for reducing their emissions. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's the way in which pressure will be exerted uh, either through outsourcing uh, or, or through trading relations across the supply chain. 
how mm. all of that will increasingly put pressure on companies to drive down their carbon emissions. Um, and then in the background, we'll see greater development of carbon pricing. So that's my yeah, yeah. vision of the future. <laughs> Good, yeah, good. So that yeah, that's in, very interesting. The whole monetarization thing as being um, the the key factor as we go forward. And and thank you for that link into the World Bank uh, uh, website. I'm sure a number of people will look at that. There's one or two other big questions I note also on government. So um, Reshma Yusuf um, from Malaysia is asking, um, can you share how country uh, can you share um, countries that do not have a green logistics policy? Um, how they and and she talks about then how they would get started and what the motivation strategy would be. Do you, is there any sort of um, um, breakdown that could be seen anywhere, Alan, in terms of um, countries that have a green logistics policy and countries that don't? Um, yeah, well, there must be I, variable quality, I would guess. <laughs> I, I wouldn't like to finger any particular country and say it's it's lagging behind in the way it's. Uh, maybe better to highlight those countries that I think are quite far ahead in, in the way that they're right. and, and then when you say countries, are we meaning government-driven policies or are we just talking about the way in which countries do? Um, I think government-driven policies yeah. probably, yeah. 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 So, so um, yeah, I'm maybe a bit biased being British and, uh, you know, I'm based in Edinburgh at the moment, which is not very far from Glasgow, where the COP26 conference will be held. Uh, the, the UK government was quite early um, in developing green logistics concepts. Um, and I was partly involved in that. That was way back in the late 1990s. I mean, there was a sustainable uh, freight strategy published by the government back then. Um, and it's, it's over the past 20 years has experimented with a whole range of initiatives to try to encourage companies to, and, and a lot of this predated decarbonization. This, this is when the F, um, emphasis was on cutting energy, mainly to clean the air, to, to re reduce the, the pollution problem. But, but of course that also translates into less uh, CO2. So, so I think the UK would be one country to look at. Another would be the Netherlands. Uh, I mean, the, the Dutch government has been quite progressive in uh, developing uh, decarbonization and, and, and pollution reducing measures for freight transport. Um, in the US too, I mean, they, since 2004, they have had what's called the Smartway program, um, uh, supported by the Environmental Protection Agency there. Um, I think about three or 4,000 companies now belong to that program. Uh, so it's a mix of shippers and transport companies, and it's all about how you improve the environmental performance of, uh, of freight transport. Uh, so I think those people on the call who are in countries that currently don't do very much in this area, it would be well advised to have a look at what's been happening mm. in the countries that I just mentioned. Mm. And, and sharing that, that that's that's really good that uh, and it actually it, well done there alan you've managed to answer two questions in one actually because i see tim tim foots also who uh, um, asked for examples of those that are doing the best and i think that yeah. you know learning from the best practices is yeah. a great um, and can i also just add to that there is an organization called the smart freight center uh, based in amsterdam in the netherlands uh, been in existence now since I think about 2013 um, and it advises both governments and companies on how they can improve the environmental performance of freight transport. I'm a bit biased because I've been on their advisory council for a number of years but they, they do great work and, and they've already had a lot of engagement both from governments and from countries, uh, around, from governments and, and businesses around the world. So uh, if you just Google Smart Freight Centre you go to their website right. and they have a lot of um, useful reports and tools that you can um, you can access. Excellent, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll stick on countries because we've got a further um, um, question about China for about this. We, we of course have um, a CRT in China, um, but uh, Eric Wong was asking, what do you think are the challenges facing car um, China in decarbonizing its transport and logistics? I'm not sure how much um, visibility you have of that. Um, and, and just any perspectives on China, really, Alan, because yeah. they're obviously a big well, part of the, yeah. the, the global footprint. Yeah. I'll, I'll preface my remarks on that, but by saying that uh, you know, Ch China has a big challenge in decarbonizing its logistics because it is essentially the workshop of the world. You know, other yeah. countries have outsourced their production essentially to China. And, and of course, when you outsource the production, 
you outsource the upper levels of the supply chain as well and, and all the related logistical activity. Um, so that, and, and again, if you look at the statistics on the growth of freight movement in China in terms of ton kilometers, it's been quite phenomenal, all right? Um, however, I mean, all credit to the Chinese government. I mean, they've done a number of interesting things in recent years to, and, and, and made a number of important commitments to, to decarbonizing uh, freight transport. Um, so they want to get a lot more freight onto the railways. Um, I mean, there's, there's um, the, the, the rail share of that market has been relatively small and there's a big potential for increasing it. Uh, thankfully, a lot of the growth in freight ton kilometers in China has actually been on waterways, right? And, and coastal shipping. You know, so it's not all necessarily gone onto the road network, but they also have got green freight schemes um, in, in China. And they're, they're making, and, and of course the Chinese are, very well ahead in electrifying their, their fleets, both of cars and of trucks as well. So uh, while they've got a tough challenge, I mean, I think they're, they're making some good progress in, in uh, decarbonizing their, their fleet. Yes, yes, and we, we, we should certainly ignore that because it's been um, very beneficial for us to um, as professionals to link with um, China and often uh, you, you understand much more of that level than you would do by um, you know, reading the press, etc. It's um, as professionals, we've got some very strong links with China. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, one continue. challenge the Chinese, of course, will have is that their electricity, um, it, a lot, much of it's generated by coal at the moment. Yeah, um, many coal-fired power stations. Now, as I said, I mean, I say the way the way we decarbonize freight transport is to electrify as much as possible, and then to rely on the decarbonization of electricity. Now. Again, China's got a big challenge in decarbonizing its electricity supply because of its very heavy dependence on coal. But, um, but I mean, China has committed to be mm. net zero as, a, as an economy by 2060 mm. or earlier, you know, so um, mm. good luck yeah. to them. Let's hope it yeah. happens. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Excellent. Um, switching um, topic, but I think a bit related because of what you just said about China and uh, electrification of vehicles. Uh, Moal Oud, and he's from Egypt, so we, we've got a great range of countries here. Uh, and thank you everybody for chipping in with these um, questions. We've got about another five minutes, so if you have got any five of questions, in fact, so if you've got any more, do add them in. But Mo is um, saying, one question I have is how can we curb down on the just-in-time concept among logistics cap companies as it's an important uh, as an important barometer of performance. So I guess he's sort of saying, hey, you know, this this thirst to get your delivery next day um, is making an impact on uh, on you know the the greenhouse gases, etc. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, for many years, environmentalists have been criticizing the just-in-time principle because they see that as the main cause of the underloading of vehicles, you know, companies prioritizing low inventory uh, and, and being prepared to sacrifice efficiency. I, I, and therefore, some people are suggesting in a low-carbon world, we can no longer afford just-in-time. We have to abandon that principle. I would caution against that, however, because just-in-time isn't just a stock control principle. I mean, it's a whole business philosophy designed to minimize waste. Um, okay, so if you relax just in time, you might fill the vehicles better and cut transport related emissions, but what would be the impact of that on the warehouses and on the factories? You know, you would then be building more inventory into your system. You might require more warehouse space. Uh, it might impact adversely on the energy efficiency of the production operation. So until you do a holistic analysis to see what the overall carbon impact of just in time is, I don't think we should just rush into abandoning it in the interests of, of transport. Mm -hmm. uh, but your other point you made was, was just speeding up because um, as I mentioned very briefly in my presentation and I've actually got a journal paper on this subject, deceleration, you know, in the transport and logistics world for generations, we've regarded progress to be make going faster, right? But the faster you go, the more energy you use, right? So what is the potential then just for slowing things down? I mean, we used to say that patience is a virtue, right? I think in a low carbon world, patience will be even more of a virtue, right? So, and, and we've got consumers now buying goods online, imagining they can get the products delivered almost instantly. You know, you order, this morning, you get it in the afternoon. Um, there is a price associated with that. There's a big environmental price associated with that. So again, consumer expectations may have to be lowered so that people 
consume products more sustainably and they don't just expect everything to be delivered and what some people now call instant logistics. I mean, I, I don't think that um, will be acceptable within the sort of low carbon world that I've been describing. Very, very good. Yeah, and I think that again um, uh, touches on the whole area of sort of, of not just snapping at one instant um, receive solution, but understand the whole, doesn't it? Um, yep. In terms of um, good, we've got. Um, I, I noticed we've got one question um, as I've been drawing through that's um, come in from in the chat actually. So I'll see if I can rescue this from the chat. It's from uh, Kakab Magul from Pakistan, um, and he talks. And now this is an area that he probably knows more about than we do. But um, he's saying, what effect will have will we will have will there be i think on cpec um if electronic trains are preferred over road transport by pakistan and other countries now i not that takes us in i think into the the the, yes. the corridor from um, from china through to pakistan doesn't it in terms of uh, yes. uh, I don't know that's an area that uh, you were encouraging electronic church trains, weren't you? Yeah. I don't yeah. have detailed knowledge of that subject. I mean, there is a, a more generic point I could make, though, is that it's clearly in the, the railway's interest to electrify as much of their network as possible, you know, yeah. um, but particularly if, if the decarbonisation of electricity occurs in line with some of the forecasts, uh, because that it seems to me for the railways, it's a big differentiator. The fact you yeah. can feed low carbon yeah. electricity directly into the, the freight transport system. But the, the big problem that is, is not so much Pakistan, and that, um, it's, it's in the Americas, because mm. very little of the rail network in, in North America or in Latin America is electrified. Um, and, and so you're gonna have to get low carbon electricity into rail freight operations there by mm. different means, you know, mm. by batteries mm. or hydrogen fuel cells and, and those technologies that are still at a fairly early stage. So that there's a problem really for the Americas, I think. In, in doing yeah. And, and is that is that also a dimension of um, the, the, the geographical scale? Or, um, is it um, easier to electrify um, in more of a, um, you know, in a UK environment or a smaller country environment than the big distances either in the States or across um, um, Eurasia, for example? Yeah, if you're starting from scratch, you know, it, yeah. it is, it is yeah. pretty expensive to, to do that. I mean, obviously, electrification has progressed gradually in many countries over a number of years. Um, you know, if, if you set out now to electrify the US rail network, um, and of course, we're mm -hmm. not just thinking of this in terms of freight transport. And I'm always seeing things through my freight lens, mm -hmm. but you'd have to justify this as much on, on passenger services, you know. Mm -hmm. So if... if if you're wanting to make less use of aviation and get more people onto surface transport using high speed electrified rail, mm. then you, you could spread the capital cost between the, the passenger movements and the freight movements as well. I think mm. if you're just trying to justify continental scale electrification of rail freight on the basis of freight, it might yeah. be difficult yeah. doing that, making that financial yeah. calculation. Yeah. Um, okay, well, um, I've got one question, key question from a CRT per perspective, just to finish up with, uh, and then, uh, it, it, which is really, so we, we've um, now got 37 countries um, globally in the CRT family, we've um, just added Korea and Rwanda, so we've got quite a spread, particularly across Eurasia and Africa, um, and into Europe, um, and across the developing world and the um, developed world. So it was um, really um, a final question, Alan, on what should CILT be doing to help tackle um, this issue globally? Yeah, I, I think um, three or four things. Um, I, I think um, one is just it, it disseminating knowledge. I, I mean, making people aware of the issue because you have this wonderful global network, you know, mm. into groups of professionals all over the world. So, so I think knowledge dissemination is, is one. Um, I, I think also related to that is, is disseminating best practice, you know, um, because uh, I think as we said earlier, in terms of green logistics, some countries that are, are, are further ahead doing that than others. Um, so, um, 
exchanging best practices. And, and it's not just best practice, it's, it's also the reverse of that. What problems have been experienced? I mean, often if you look at the, the literature, it only tells the good news stories, but, but often it's good exchanging information about what went wrong and why it went wrong and, and so that others can avoid the same pitfalls. I think a third role might be to liaise with some of the other international organizations in this space. You know, I, I, I've identified some of them in my presentation and in answering questions. Um, you know, the, the UN has various agencies working in this area. Um, there are various business organizations like We Mean Business and so forth. Um, I think it'd be quite nice if there was a connection between CILT and these other organizations and also with the other professional bodies. I mean, I, my university is based in Germany. So there we've got BVL. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, because um, th there's a common interest in a sense in, in raising awareness of environment across all of these transport professional organizations. Um, and then, then finally, it, on the skills side, because obviously you've got a role in designing curricula, uh, accrediting mm. transport mm. professionalism, as I said earlier, try to um, make environmental issues, particularly decarbonization, core to all of that. and, and um, and, and uh, obviously build up the, the content that you have in those areas as well. So th there's a shopping list of things for you to yeah, do, yeah. Keith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll keep you busy. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be pleased, uh, I've noted all those down. You'll be pleased, uh, I'm sure our president refer that at least a couple of those areas we, we've been progressing, but a, a very interesting response. Thanks, Alan, so yep. much. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, um, Alan, for all, um, A, for such an informative presentation and uh, uh, two for answering all those questions from everybody, but I'm going to um, pass over now to um, our international president, who's just going to give his thanks to to you for uh, uh, for today. Um, so, Dato Radzak, the floor is Thank yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Keith. Uh, may I, on behalf of CLT, uh, thank uh, Professor Alan McKinnon for leading this webinar today. I found this presentation uh, enlightening and remarkably focused on uh, our industry role in tackling the problem of climate change and addressing the sustainability topic so well. I remember that Professor Allen spoke at our centenary celebrations at the Savoy Hotel in November 2019. So I was very pleased that he was willing to lead our discussion on this topic today. Thank you, uh, Professor, you know, for making time with us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to remind you that journey in 2021 and beyond is an interesting part of the survival of CLT International. The five focus areas need special attention from all branches and territories in CILT. As part of inclusivity and care for every member, sharing of expertise and opportunities, best practices, the idea of International Business Forum was set up to invite especially CILT members who are entrepreneurs to be more active in looking for business activities while establishing networking and expanding business abroad by way of setting up consortium and partnership among them and associates. That is number one. Number two is green technology and sustainability. Time for us to develop solutions. We need to share experiences among us encourage collaboration so that we can assist one and another. Now, the third one is in terms of digitization and industrial revolution 4.0, we need to be ahead in applying it as tools to facilitate trade across nation and continents. Happy to note some of us have moved forward in application of technologies such as blockchain and big data analytics. Now we have over the last year concentrated on supporting our members and branches through the COVID pandemic. In 2021, we anticipate moving out of the pandemic and leading our profession in the key issues of coming decade and beyond. Two of those issues, sustainability and digitization, are our particular focus this year. 
Ladies and gentlemen, some says digitization and sustainability a match made in heaven. Others say it's a game changer and many agree it is a positive mutual reinforcement. And I personally believe digitalization and sustainability is a perfect combination. Now we are focusing on sustainability as one of my five focus areas in my presidential term. We will be having another two webinars addressing this subject and will produce a comprehensive bulletin in June with over 50 contributions from across the CLT world. Our other areas of focus are digitization, inclusivity, uncharted territories for CLT and the sharing of best practices. Now, having said that, I begin to realize that the issue of digitization and sustainability, the overall concept and perimeter of this is not purely on logistics and it is really messy. It is not purely on logistics and transport, but the whole development, including urban planning, people's standard of living, economic and business activities, agricultural and food security, and so on and on and on. The list is not exhausted. As logistics and transport professional, we are doing our part now, diligently. I was especially interested to see how Professor Allen connected the potential solution with digitization as the route to enable us to tackle the emissions issue. We follow in the second half of the year, we have focused on this subject and the bridge between the two is easy to see when explained in such a way uh, as has been explained today. Digital solution will enable more efficient and easier transport of goods and people, opportunities for collaboration between competing organization and removal of barriers of trade the increasing ability to handle and exchange huge amount of data will be the breakthrough. And this comes with a time when data exchange and accuracy are critical when health and well-being have to have higher focus. May I on behalf uh, of CRT to thank Professor Alan McKinnon and Keith for the input into an excellent session today. This webinar has been recorded, so please share the recording with your members and colleagues in your own country and region. Join our online discussion and participate on our international and branch social media platform. Our next webinar will be on June 23rd. We are focused on sustainability in the maritime sector, and we will have the international lineup of speakers from across the world. Thank you so much. Do keep safe. And uh, thanks again for joining us today. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dato. Um, so watch out for that webinar. There is also a bulletin coming out where we've got um, over 70 articles that are coming globally, which we'll be uh, distributing on the 6th of um, the, the target date is the 6th of June. So look out for that. And uh, um, yeah, thank you um, to everybody for joining and, and thank you, Professor Allen, again for, from me. So well done, everybody, and uh, have a good rest of your day, wherever you are. Mm -hmm.